Bienvenue à la session scientifique du département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa. La session se veut bilingue. Vous êtes invité à poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Bonne session! Cette présentation sera enregistrée et est disponible sur la chaîne YouTube du département de médecine familiale. En poursuivant la session, vous consentez à être enregistré si votre caméra ou microphone est activé. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Department of Family Medicine YouTube channel. By continuing the session, you are consenting to be recorded if your camera or microphone is activated. Nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui à partir de nombreux endroits différents et dans un espace virtuel. Mais nous désirons commencer par reconnaître les terres sur lesquelles se trouve le département de médecine familiale de l'Université d'Ottawa, qui font partie du territoire traditionnel non cédé du peuple Anishinaabe algonquin. Nous vous invitons à réfléchir à votre propre emplacement au Canada par rapport au territoire où vous vous trouvez aujourd'hui. Nous reconnaissons aussi les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels, jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons leurs courageux dirigeants d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. Akonongum egawi kad ki migwewaj. Nimanajianaanig kakina anishnabeg undaje kaye ugug kakina eneagizijig enekuka mekak kanadang eje udapinagig endawajin udawang. We are gathered today from many different locations and in a virtual space but we wish to begin by recognizing the land on which the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa is located, which is part of the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. We invite you to think about your own location in Canada in relation to the territory where you find yourself today. We also acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders past, present and future. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the May edition of uh, Family Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, today's presentations uh, come from uh, come to us today from uh, the Primrose uh, Family Medicine Center. And uh, without any further ado, I'll introduce our uh, first speaker. And um, he's none other than uh, Dr. Alan Ng. And uh, Alan received his medical degree from the University of Dundee in Scotland and completed his family medicine training uh, with the Northwest London General Practice Vocational Training Scheme in the UK. Um, he holds postgraduate diplomas in child health, obstetrics, and tropical medicine, and uh, returned virtually to the University of Dundee to complete a master's in medical education. Congratulations, Alan. Uh, Alan's worked in a wide variety of environments in general practice uh, in the British National Health Service, uh, Northern Saskatchewan amongst First Nations communities in Myanmar uh, with Doctors Without Borders and an urban and suburban practice in Saskatoon and Ottawa before uh, joining us here at the Department of Family Medicine, where he currently practices as a clinician teacher at the Primrose Family Medicine Centre. He's our department's uh, behavioral medicine and, uh, uh, and is a clinician educator with the Department of, of Certification and Examination for the College of Family Physicians Canada. Um, his current academic interests include the assessment of the consultation in family medicine, use of uh, medical humanities in family medicine education, and valent groups, which he's going to be talking about today. His current obsession is spending the winters trying to build the perfect backyard skating rink for his kids in spite of climate change. So without further ado, Alan, I'm going to pass things on to you. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And... Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so I am going to be talking about uh, balant groups in family medicine residency programs. And um, um, so um, I'm going to presume some of you probably know a lot about balant groups. Uh, some of you know a little, and some of you may never have heard of balant groups before. So I'm aiming to 
to speak to all of you as um, in the context that you're all sort of family docs and teachers um, of family medicine. I want to just acknowledge um, the help I have received from uh, Dr. Robin Beardsley, uh, who is my balance co-leader currently um, in uh, the residency program here in Ottawa, and also the American Balance Society, uh, who has actually helped me with some of these slides. So I just want to say I have no conflicts of interest. Um, so I'll just get started. So this is a very interesting topic now uh, because of this little pesky thing, this uh, COVID-19 virus. Uh, because doctors are more stressed, patients are more stressed, residents, learners are more stressed, and that's going to affect doctor-patient relationships, peer relationships, learner-preceptor relationships, learner-learner relationships, and this has really become the perfect storm for what I term as dysfunctional consultations in family practice, and, and this is where balance sort of comes in. Um, the other thing about Ballant uh, is normally before COVID, we would be doing this uh, like this, sitting in a circle um, in person, and we had to move from doing Ballant this way to doing Ballant this way, and that's also come with its own challenges. Now, those of you who know me probably know I'm a total nerd, um, but I'm more, uh, I'm more Star Trek than Star Wars. However, I think Yoda said this best because balance is full of metaphorical thinking. So as we start, I just wanna say metaphors be with you and that will uh, become clear as we move through this talk. So what I'm hoping to do in 15 to 20 minutes is to talk about um, uh, who was balance, What are balance groups? Why should residents do balance, Where do balance groups fit in the curriculum? When should residents do balance? and how do balance groups work? So uh, that's a lot to sort of go through, but I hope to be able to cover most of that in the next um, 15 to 20 minutes. So firstly, the easy question, who was Balant? So Balant is actually a guy, he's a person. He, uh, is a, he was a Hungarian psychotherapist um, and he, he worked, he became basically known for working with general practitioners in the UK after World War II, basically, forming um, discussion groups with uh, essentially burnt out family dogs, GPs, uh, who were having difficulties with patients. And at that time, consultations were basically six minutes in length. That was the average time of visit. So you can understand perhaps why they were stressed. Um, he published a book called The Doctor, His Patient and the Illness in 1957, which is sort of the basis of, of balanced work. What are balance groups? So essentially a balance group consists of between six to 12 doctors with one to two leaders, and it meets regularly, usually for one to two hours. And the group is a continuous group. So they continue to meet regularly, usually over the course of one or more years. Um, there is a group in Ottawa that has actually, and my colleague Robin um, is actually part of this group uh, that has been actually meeting for 30 years um, in Ottawa. And that's the longest balance group I've ever heard of. Um, case presentations are made during the group, usually dealing with a challenging encounter. And the idea is to explore the perspective, the case from the perspective of the doctor patient relationship. So why should family medicine residents do balance? So I'm gonna sort of call on a, another colleague of mine from the American Balance Society who actually succinctly, um, quite nicely sort of summarized the main reasons why this should be in family medicine residency. Um, one of the questions is what are the challenges that all clinicians have? Because everyone has a balance case and that includes attendings, residents, medical students. They have a patient that stays on their mind for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, where in the curriculum is this challenge address and addressed? And, basically nowhere else but, but balance. Um, second reason, uh, medical education is filled with medical algorithms, clinical guidelines, decision trees, and other memorizable rules that are essential in the diagnosis and treatment decisions. So this is what we teach, but this is only half of the picture because the other half is how one transfers all of this knowledge to actual human beings who have illness experiences as well as disease. And where in the curriculum is that set of guidelines? Where in the curriculum are residents taught how to listen in order to truly understand their patient's problems. Reason three, most medical thinking has to do with logical and analytical thinking. So where are physicians taught how to use their own emotional intelligence or even to identify the relevance of these emotions? And actually the fact that it is actually 
normal to have emotional reactions to challenging patients and how we can use that to develop and maintain the doctor-patient relationship. And then the fourth reason is that participate, participating in balance actually re requires accepting a different kind of educational process. And these, you cannot learn this in a lecture or even as I'm doing in a PowerPoint, um, you have to experience this. It's very experiential. Um, rather than the teaching and learning that comes from outside in, this type of education comes from the inside out. And this is true of all reflective practices, which is something we really need to be um, fostering in our learners, our residents. Um, bit of a lit review. This was actually, I had some help with this from another colleague in, from the American Balance Society, who's actually a psychiatrist at Dalhousie, um, did a lit review. Um, balance groups can lead to reduction in burnout in primary care um, physicians across three areas of the Maslach burnout inventory, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced sense of personal accomplishment. Um, however, when it comes to looking at quantitative research on balance, studies are actually quite scarce. The methodology is heterogeneous and the results are actually quite mixed. Having said that, um, there are numerous qualitative studies which point to a robust utility of the balance method. Um, Player um, conducted a qualitative study on just graduated family, resident, family medicine residents after 24 months of balance, and they found that balance promoted, quotes, being the doctor the patient needs, um, uh, with reflection, empathy, looking at blind spots, bonding, venting, acceptance, perspective taking, and developing uh, appreciation for individual experiences. And Kledgeman found that balance groups increased influence, sorry, influenced competence, professional identity, and a sense of security, which increased through parallel processes, creating a base of endurance and satisfaction, thus enabling general practitioners to rediscover the joy of being a physician. And these themes match what Balance aims to provide for physicians. So where does Balance fit in our curriculum? So I'm gonna give you two assumptions that we were making when we talk about family medicine. Remember, family medicine is a postmodern specialty. Um, I don't know if uh, you've thought of it in that term, but um, what that essentially means is the values of postmodern theory are uncertainty, which we have a lot, complexity, which we have a lot, nonlinear narratives, patients don't, uh, haven't read Harrison's textbook of medicine when they come to us with their stories, um, and um, different voices and experiences of reality. So this is sort of what uh, the postmodern paradigm sort of uh, is based on. And postmodern theory is actually closer to the values and experience of family medicine than the modern values of a scientific rationalism. And we have to remember that family medicine is a generalist field and it's defined by the person. It's not defined by a bodily system like cardiology or orthopedics. It's not defined by age like pediatrics or geriatrics. It's not defined by gender like obstetrics and gynecology. It's not defined by level of acuity like emergency medicine. It is defined by the person. Uh, and this is why, <coughs> excuse me, Ballant, uh, which deals with this um, is so important. The second assumption is thinking about how we actually apply, I guess, or how we work. And we have to remember that the consultation is our tool um, and uh, it's central to family medicine. This is basically what we do. Um, now, we may not have thought of the consultation as more than just maybe a place where we actually see patients, but the consultation is actually a thing. And when I say consultation, just for a bit of jargon, what I'm referring to is basically the doctor-patient interview, the office visit, the office encounter, the doctor-patient encounter, all of this means the same thing as consultation. And uh, I like to use that term partly because in my training, that's, that's how we refer to the visit, but also when you do research, um, you're looking at lit reviews, et cetera, um, on doctor-patient relationships, balance, et cetera, the consultation is a term that is, oft, is primarily used in the, in the med literature. And the consultation is a thing. Uh, there's been lots written about the processes that take place. I had told you I was a total nerd and I'm also a consultation nerd. I've actually read these books, uh, but it is an interest. Um, and consultation models, you're probably familiar in some sense of some of the models. For example, this model, which is the patient-centered clinical method um, from Western University. This is where we get Fife from. Um, another model that's quite commonly used is the Calgary-Cambridge model, which um, particularly undergrad, um, in, amongst undergrads uh, on how to communicate uh, effectively with patients. 
Balance model, Balance is a consultation model and um, it's very, very process oriented. I'm going to explain what these um, terms mean shortly in time. When you, when I ask, uh, if you think about it, if I asked all of you, what is your consultation model? The, the correct answer, answer would actually be whatever model works for you, for your particular patient in your particular situation and context. But when we teach this to residents, um, it's useful to introduce them to different types of models because essentially they are going to choose their model, the model that works best for them. Um, and when we talk about consultation models, it is what works best for them. And different consultation models are basically part of your toolkit. Um, I like to use the analogy, this is a metaphor, of the final common pathway, just like the lower motor neuron or the coagulation pathway, which we learned as undergrad med students. Um, the final common pathway, um, you can look at uh, our CANMEDS FM competencies. All of it basically comes down to what we do in the consultation. So that's why understanding the consultation as, as a thing, um, uh, as a process, is, is really important for us as medical, as, as educators in family medicine. This is just another way of showing this. Um, our... our um, Competencies are all distilled basically into being in the room with the patient where the rubber hits the road. And this is essentially just another way of saying this is where theory essentially becomes practice. And does it matter? Well, we do get, we do assess the residents on this. Uh, the simulated office oral, the SU, is actually a type of consultation model. And I'm, I'm not going to say the SU is perfect, but. Um, it is actually part of uh, the summative assessment. So it behoves us to be able to, to teach this effectively. Now, before I go into more, more details about balance, just a few um, uh, medical ed concepts. Uh, balance is based on one, one concept is constructivism, which is that knowledge is constructed from experience. It's a personal interpretation of the world. And it's an active process where the teacher is viewed not as the transmitter of knowledge, but as a guide who facilitates learning. And that's what happens in Ballant. Uh, we as leaders don't tell or teach um, residents what to do. Sorry. Uh, we, we act as uh, essentially a guide. Kolb's um, learning cycle is another important concept uh, because in order for learners to really have deep learning, they need to actually go through all four of these sort of experiences to have an experience, reflect on it, theorize, and then practice. Balance would fit certainly firmly here in the reflective observation part. Um, you can come into the cycle at any point, but if you want deep learning to happen, you have to encourage, we have to encourage our residents to go through the whole cycle. And then the last theory I just want to mention is social learning theory, which is Vygotsky. Um, essentially what that he's, what he's saying is that learning is located through co-participation cool interaction with other people. So essentially the power of group learning. Learners are stretched beyond what they can do with the help of others in what is known as the zone of proximal development. And that is essentially what Balmont does. Okay, one thing I, I do wanna talk about um, is this concept, it's, it's another metaphor. I don't know if you've, you've probably all heard of Michael Crichton. If you, haven't, if you don't know who he is, you know his work. He's a, an author, director, screenwriter, and um, you'll probably know that he, you may know he created ER, he, he created it, directed it, directed the first season. He also wrote Jurassic Park amongst other um, not many novels. But Crichton was also actually a doctor. He's an MD, he went to Harvard and he wrote a memoir. And in this memoir, he actually um, described what it was like to dissect a body when he was a first year medical student. And one of the tasks he was, one of the things he had to do, he and his group, while he was doing this was to actually using a saw make a sagittal cut through a head so that he could split the head in two um, and uh, so you would have the sagittal section which his his anatomy group could could work on and of course nobody wanted to do to actually do this they were all first year med students Michael Crichton decided okay I'm going to do it um, and uh, he described it uh, in his book um, his memoir travels he said Somewhere inside me, there was this kind of click, a shutting off, a refusal to acknowledge in ordinary human terms what I was doing. I learned that the shutting off click 
was essential to becoming a doctor. You could not function if you were overwhelmed by what was happening. So uh, he was thinking about this as he was taking that saw and cutting through this cadaver's head. He learned, he then wrote, still later I learned that the best doctors found a middle position where they were neither overwhelmed by their feelings or estranged from them. This was the most difficult position of all. The precise balance was something few learned. And Roger Neighbor, who is an academic family physician in the UK, um, described this as Crichton's switch. And what we actually need to do is to help residents find that switch. And I'm not talking about this kind of switch, we can just turn it on and off. We, it's probably better to help them find this type of switch, which is the dimmer switch, which you can definitely adjust depending on your situation. So I quite like that metaphor. Um, we'll talk a bit about now balance insights into the consultation specifically. Ballant um, um, noted <clears throat> when, when family docs talk to patients, there's an emotional relationship that develops, which may or may not be obvious, but there always is one. Um, there can be collusion where the doctor and the patient may decide what they want to discuss and not want to discuss. If things are a bit ambiguous, the doctor may have a, a concern with alcohol, him or herself. And this may sort of come up in the, in the story. They, he may decide you know, not, not to go there. Um, there's the phenomenon of counter-transference that feelings that arise during the consultation may actually be coming from the patient. So feeling angry or upset um, certainly could be coming from the patient. There's the phenomenon of the entry ticket and hidden agenda, which I think all of you are familiar with that patients don't usually often come in with what they, what is written on the appointment slip or the, the, as the reason for visit. And there often is something else going on. The doctor as drug is another quite famous uh, balantism, I guess, uh, and uh, refers to the fact that the doctor, him or herself, is a very powerful medication. So it's interesting that doctors don't necessarily do anything, or you don't feel you've done anything, uh, but the effect you have is still very, very powerful regardless. Uh, but like other drugs, there are dosages, dosages of the doctor, and there are side effects as well, as well as allergies. The collusion of anonymity is another balantism that just refers to this phenomenon that uh, very often, particularly in academic units where there's probably more opportunity, patients can bounce either from specialist to specialist or from one resident to another, or sometimes in, um, from one attending to another with no one actually taking responsibility for the patient as a person. He described the mutual investment fund, which is essentially just saying that all the experience the shared experience and trust that the doctor accumulate over many years is really key and valuable. Something we are finding more difficult as we as continuity becomes more of an issue. And then there's this term, the apostolic function, which is the doctor's tendency to have unrealistic expectations of the patient based on the doctor's own values. And uh, examples, you know, I don't drink alcohol, so I think my patient should give it up. Or I think work is really important, so I'm not going to give this patient a sick note. Or if I believe my job is to diagnose serious illness, I'm likely to believe that my patient's ideas and worries are relatively trivial. But on the other hand, if I believe patient's ideas and concerns are important, I will actually seek them out. When should residents do Bowman? Well, I would say as often as possible, but uh, the ideal would be weekly. Um, in my experience, when I was a resident, we did Bowman weekly, but um, it was attached to a... Um, uh, my academic, we, we didn't have academic um, full days monthly. We had an academic half day weekly. And so we would always um, have a uh, sort of uh, presentation, often didactic on all sorts of family medicine topics, but we always had to do balance at the end of that session. So, you know, um, so every week. And in a way that was interesting because balance sort of just got, we just got used to, to having it as part of our curriculum regularly. Um, but some balance is better than no balance. And I'm aware, I'm aware of time. So um, I'm just going to quickly go through how a balance group works just in the last minute. But what a balance group isn't is it's not a traditional case consultation group, an m, &M conference, a support group, and it's not prescriptive, didactic, or advice giving. Um, although balance groups are not therapy, they can actually be therapeutic, however, having said that. So we have basically a group um, with two leaders and the leader asks for a case. 
the cases, um, the presentations are spontaneous. So they are they're from memory and not by using notes. They're patients that ideally we have ongoing relationships and usually patients we feel conflicted or strongly about um, that we take home, that we're thinking about, um, that we sometimes lose sleep over or patients that just bubble up in the moment. Examples, uh, there are many, many examples. Uh, in fact, most any case could be a balance case, but often it's the patients that have chronically medically unexplained symptoms or patients that always seem to be asking for inappropriate things, prescriptions, letters, certificates, et cetera, or patients that are just rude and sarcastic, particularly the ones that point out the resident's extreme youth and lack of experience. So someone will say in the group, I have a case, and then we'll, we'll dis discuss the case. The leader will ask for clarifying questions. And then we actually ask the presenter to sit back. So the presenter actually doesn't take part in the act first part of the discussion. And then the group starts working about what is going on. And again, we stick to what is going on between the doctor and the patient. Um, and that continues. And then that's basically it. Um, the idea is to provide a safe space for emotional reflection, to help the presenter consider other understandings of the case to look at blind spots and assumptions to help the members feel less isolated and to help members grow and develop. There are differences from traditional teaching though. Problem solving is definitely discouraged. We aren't trying to solve clinical issues. We want our, our, the uh, residents to think divergently, not convergently. So think about possibilities, speculation, and there may not be a right or wrong answer. Sorry, there may not be a right or correct answer and often sessions may end without any real closure, which can be difficult, I think, for learners that are very goal oriented Briefly, we've had some feedback this year, which has actually been very encouraging. In the past, I have to say that uh, we have had our, str our struggles with Valent, um, but so far um, the residents seem, the ones, the sessions we've done this year seem to have gone quite well. Um, so essentially, uh, just to summarize, um, remember that family medicine, our specialty is a postmodern generalist specialty centered on the person. The consultation is our primary tool. Balance groups address the postmodern paradigm by helping residents to understand the doctor patient relationship, the role of emotion and reflective practice. And particularly now in times of uncertainty, lack of connection and stress, balance work meets both curricular and professional needs as the scope for having dysfunctional consultation increases. This is a good time to be doing balance. And that's it. Um, any questions in the one minute I have left? Oh, Alan, we, we do have a few minutes for questions and thank you very much for that presentation. And thank you for bringing in some uh, learning theory and learning approaches uh, into your presentation. Much appreciated. Um, med ed. Yeah. <laughs> So um, we actually have some questions in the chat uh, to start and uh, feel free folks to raise your hand uh, if you have an additional question. But your first one, first question comes from uh, David Ponka. Um, and um, I'll just read out what he said. Al, what an informative overview of the background behind Valent. I was especially interested in framing it in postmodern constructivist theory. You have worked in many different cultures around the world, often where physicians don't enjoy as much agency as we do. Would Ballant be successful in Myanmar, where you worked? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. It would be base. It's it would be useful basically anywhere where you have where there's a doctor-patient relationship. Um, so it works, and uh, Wonka actually uh, the. International Balance Federation uh, ran uh, groups for young physicians all over the world um, virtually to, to introduce them to this concept. So, but Balance would be uh, useful in any situation where there's, um, where you see a patient. Uh, ideally it should be continuity, but it doesn't have to be. That's the short answer, yes. Great. Um, uh, Claire's asked about the evidence of effectiveness and have we done our own evaluation here at DFM? And I did see that you, you put up a slide on that. I, I, yeah, sorry, Claire, I skipped over that. I was just concerned about time. We do evaluate our continually on 145. Um, we had a bit of a hiccup this year, um, uh, but we do, but what we are wanting to do is I am in touch with colleagues at three other sites because we want to run a multi-center 
um, eva evaluation of their, because they're in a similar situation to us where we've got balance sort of going or struggling to get balance on off the ground. And there is, you know, there's always competition for this in other, you know, with, with other curricular things that are going on. So it's a bit of a fight to get it going. I've been lucky at U Ottawa because we, we, we've actually have been able to do this for the last few years, but uh, U of T Memorial, U of T and Memorial in particular, um, we're, we are doing some collaboration where we're going to try and assess this. So yes, we are wanting to do more research. Great. Um, there are some other comments in the in the chat. Thanks, Alan. Um, does anybody else have any other uh, uh, questions or comments that they'd uh, like to share? Can I? Yeah, by all means, Prisa. Go ahead. Alan, that was fantastic. Uh, the theory and the conversational domain that you provided us so that we can actually name some of the experiences that are residents experience. I really appreciate that. And if we could just get the summary of the slides, that would be very helpful. I think my yeah, biggest uh, concern, or at least the one that I experienced, because I did balance group with, uh, with Herschel Kagan, actually, when I was a resident. Now you know how long ago I was a resident. I think um, what was interesting in our uh, balance was that Herschel was actually not a member of groups with whom we worked clinically. And that provided an incredible safety for us to be very frank and even, you know, present some of the triangulation that we would experience with our staff as we were trying to navigate. You know, there's a lot of triangulation that happens in the consultation when the resident is seeing a patient uh, with the you know the physician in charge interfering or whatnot and so i wonder if we've addressed that with our residents in terms of you know when you conduct them of course they work with you clinically or if i were to do that how do we overcome that safety? Because again, when I did my study of the underrepresented women, it was extremely important for them to know that no data will be seen by me until it's completely stripped of identity. So how do we do that? So yes, so that's an excellent question. And I kind of whipped through, there was a slide, I think I, I, confidentiality is key. So one of the important things, and I guess my ulterior motive for doing this presentation is I am looking for teachers who are interested in helping to co-lead the groups. Because right now, Robin Beardsley and I are co-leading our group at Bruyere Primrose, but I, I teach those residents. The, the ideal is to have co-leaders who are, would have no evaluation um, who don't evaluate the residents uh, at all. Um, and, uh, but we always say at the beginning uh, of each group, this is totally confidential. And if your preceptor came to me and said, how is Dr. So-and-so doing in Valent? We would just say, I can't say anything about that. Um, it's to what, what, it's like Vegas, you know, what, what, what happens in Valent stays in Valent. So um, we make that absolutely clear because the way this works is it has to be safe. And that's the problem we've had in the past. Uh, when balance is not safe, the whole thing becomes a bit toxic. It gets dropped, and then it takes two or three years to try and get it going again. And that's that's happened here at Ottawa. So uh, we um, are very very cognizant of that. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Alan. Fabulous presentation and discussion. Much appreciated. I'll now move things over to our second presentation. And we have two speakers uh, who don't really need introduction, but I'm going to introduce them uh, anyways. Uh, first is uh, Dr. Sohel Rangwala, a full-time family doc at the Primrose Family Medicine Center. He provides comprehensive primary care to patients and has an interest in HIV primary care. He's been working at Primrose since 2008 and is currently the medical director. He has a passion for medical education, mentorship, and resident and faculty wellness. Some of his past roles have included unit postgrad director, uh, for a short period postgrad program director, and is currently the recruitment and selection director for the Department of Family Medicine. And that's going to be the topic of our uh, presentation today. 
Uh, some of the scholarly interests are focused on medical education and selection. And last but not least, he's a Habs fan. So we know what you'll be doing tonight, uh, uh, So Hill. Um, Dr. Ed Seal, uh, graduate of McGill uh, Medicine and Family Medicine Residency Program here at U Ottawa. He completed his uh, third year in emergency medicine in 95 and is a community family physician working in a group practice in Orleans. He practiced emergency medicine at the Montfort from 95 to 2012 and is a, has been a community resident preceptor since 2008. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine since 2007, and he is currently our program director and has been since 2018. So without further ado, uh, Sohel and Ed, I hand things over to you. So uh, thanks uh, very much, Doug, and good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see everybody here. Uh, I, I want to say that I'm not a primrose preceptor, but I am part of the team. <laughs> I'm part of everybody's team. Uh, and I just did want to just take the second to say, Alan, that was an out of the park presentation, very you know, exciting and interesting. And just to let you know how integral that is to accreditation, this uh, concept of the self-reflective practice. So I'm using my couple minutes here to, to plug what you're doing. So that was great. Um, so thank you. Uh, this is uh, uh, related to the uh, CARMS residency uh, matching service that we're all involved in. And it's, it's part of something that we've been thinking about, Soho and myself, for the last little while. And we're looking at how we could improve it. So we'll, this is a, lo a long, uh, what, what one would call a long um, um, uh, title for um, maybe a short concept. We don't have any conflicts of interest, so we can go right past this. And I'd like to say thank you to a number of people, primarily Chandra, uh, Kim Rosan, Sylvie Ford Martel, and Doug Archibald, Kendall Noel, and Marjorie Palmer Lowe. And uh, Kendall and Palmer Lee, uh, Kendall and Marjorie have been very helpful as well. Uh, prim primarily, though, I do want to say thank you to Chandra. She was instrumental in, in helping us set up our prime uh, our grant uh, in terms of data analysis, uh, data collection. Uh, graphic analysis, slide uh, presentation, and basically it wasn't so much that Sohil and I bounced our ideas off her, but the other way around. So I just wanted to just be very clear about things. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So objectives, as you can no doubt imagine, we're going to review what we uh, have done previously and presently for the CARMS review file, uh, uh, CARMS file review process. Um, why we thought our, uh, researching this a little bit more in depth was useful and helpful. We're going to look at some of the preliminary results we uh, gleaned from this past uh, CARMS um, uh, process, uh, sort of January, February, March. And we're looking for feedback and ideas. And really, so if you look at these objectives, they're actually twofold. One is to, um, uh, you know, discuss presentation in general, but the other one is really the feedback and ideas portion of this, because this is an ongoing study uh, and we want to, it's it's over two or three years. So anything you can provide us, whether uh, in terms of file review in general, either today in the question period or later on, if you have some ideas that were either sparked from this discussion or from other thoughts you've had, we'd, be, we'd welcome it because it could uh, form part of our second portion that'll happen next year. Uh, next slide. So we do something that's quite, and we've always done something that's quite similar to the 17 other uh, medical schools across the country. We, uh, our process is quite, wouldn't say it's all that, <laughs> all that idiosyncratic. We pretty well do the same thing. We, a bunch, and we use the term a bunch because every school is different. There's about a thousand, at least for the Department of Family Medicine here in Ottawa, we get about a thousand different uh, applications every year through CARMS, the CARMS process. Then we score them. We review them and score them. That's a long process. It requires about 125 faculty, each one 10 or 12. And this is how things have gone on for many years. People do it at all different hours of the day and night. They do it on their weekends, on the, uh, you know, in the evenings, whenever they get a chance to go through their 10 or 12 that they were given. And everybody does it a little bit differently. Based on this process, if you want to call it that, uh, approximately 600 interviews are offered based on the review, and they're also ranked. 
So not only were they offered an interview, they're, 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 they're given a score, and these scores, as well as their interview scores, form their final rank order list. So then the Tinder dance begins, and we, we rank them, they, they rank us, and lo and behold, three years later, we're married, in the, or well, maybe not three years, three months later, we're married, and there's a match. So that's the process in, in, in general. That's the way it's been for many years. And most of you have been involved in this process of can, can relate and can sort of see maybe some of the benefits and flaws of this process. So why we felt we needed some change? Well, as you can see, depending on the individual, depending on how tired you were at the time you did the file, uh, if it was at the end of a long day or whatever, there is by the very nature, a lack of interrate reliability. The scores can vary dramatically depending on those issues, but also who's actually doing it. And in fact, uh, Eric Wooltorton used to call them the hawks and the doves. Those people are a little tougher and those people are a little bit easier. Um, and it's a large administrative burden. There's tons of people involved. And not only is there an administrative burden, it often ended up with some people didn't do their administrative burden. And there's about 50 to 75 files not reviewed every year. So that meant that 50 to 75 people were invited for interviews and we had no idea whether they were actually budding neurosurgeons or not because we never looked at their files because it was unfair to not invite them because they, you know, they, uh, they wanted to come for the interview, but we didn't have a chance to look at their files. So we brought them anyway. So why did we want this new process? Well, I think I've, you know, enumerated a few uh, reasons. We wanted to establish inter-rater reliability and establish a consistent file review process. I thought that was, we thought that this was very important. Ultimately, if we were able to be successful this way, we hope that by establishing a consistent way of doing things, we would later on be able to figure out how to match the best, uh, the best residents for our, our program and finally lead to a less overwhelming process and much more standardized. And think of it, part of it has to do with equity. Um, it doesn't, we wanted it to be around the concept of equity in that it's not so dependent on the characteristics, the characteristics of the file reviewer, but on the characteristics of the person who is applying to our program. And that's, you know, information and sort of the processes that were laid down previously by Eric, uh, Will Torton, Gary Viner, and Alice Nair, who felt that these were really the way in which we should go about selecting our candidates. And uh, we will hope that this process would help a little bit. So on the left of this file is what we did previously. And then in January of, 2020, uh, January of 2020, yes, we changed things a little bit. We said, we're gonna use less people this time, but they're gonna do more files. We're gonna choose two dates and we're gonna sit down together and we're just gonna cram through all together in, in doing this as a team. And the process was, if we can do this pro properly, one of, the, one of the goals would be that we'd have, actually have no unreviewed uh, dossiers. Um, and in fact, this wasn't, you know, this concept wasn't entirely new. I'd kind of heard from other program directors that they used one or two file reviewers. And I thought that was novel. I thought that was a great idea, but we decided to do, you know, instead of having everybody involved, we said somewhere in between. So not one or two, but maybe less people involved. But also there was two concepts that we thought were important. One was to have a standardization session before where we would get together and have a, 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 um, a, a process by which we felt that people could consider following uh, some of the red flags we thought were important. And we had a discussion period with everybody involved um, to sort of say, what did you feel, what do, what do you think are the red flags? What do you think are the important things to, to come out of a file review? And we got together in, on two separate occasions and did this same session with the people who were involved in looking at the file reviews. And we were able to establish a consensus of, let's say, norms of, thought, uh, of thoughts and concepts that we thought were important when looking at a file. The second important aspect of that were we were all together in real time so that as the day went along, we could pose questions to each other, which we thought would help establish um, some consensus as well. So uh, if people had questions about a certain element of the file, they could ask the other person in the, the, the group as a whole in the room what their thoughts were on this. And so, so finally, these are just some things that came out of this. Just I'm just going to point a couple of in that we did a, a pilot study after that, uh, that uh, and, and after this first session in 2020 and got some, uh, got some answers as to 
how they, we, we sent out an evaluation form. How did you feel it went? A lot of people felt it was, it was either a bit quicker or at least no, no slower. They felt it was, you know, uh, they felt it was fair. It was a fair process and they enjoyed it. So I just go to the next slide. Uh, these are some of the feedback comments. They loved it. Count me in. We thought it was great. The pro process was fun. It was uh, collaborative. There was com camaraderie, the, et cetera, et cetera. The bottom line, though, is that, um, and these were, this is a wordle, the bottom line is that it lent to a certain, um, um, it actually lent to a little bit of bonding as well. This was an actual fun process. We turned something that was kind of difficult that we did in the evenings on the weekends, but it was actually kind of an interesting process that brought the group together to find solutions to the CARMS dilemma of having this wide ranging concept of, you know, who gets selected to the process, uh, to, to the program. So that turns us over to the study. And this is where Sohil comes in because we took the germs of this, of this pilot where we said, we're gonna get together. We're gonna, we're gonna try and get some, establish um, some, um, some a little bit more objective uh, determining factors uh, and turn it into a study. And so uh, I'm gonna ask Sohil to go over the next little bit and talk about our prime grant. Perfect, all right. So thanks, Ed. And again, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so basically Ed has kind of taken us on the journey so far of how we got to kind of being awarded our, our prime grant, which we were very fortunate for. And I think the idea was, you know, we knew there was a dossier review process in place. And as we mentioned, we knew there was potential for maybe enhancements, you know, and again, maybe not. That's why we're studying this to actually see. And we don't want to discount kind of, and I, I think Ed mentioned a bit, there was a lot of really good work done uh, by, by Allison Ayer, Eric Walterton, Gary Viner, uh, that really laid a really good foundation for us to kind of build on and see kind of how we could potentially move forward. So we were awarded the grant. Um, and basically, you know, obviously this grant had some objectives. And Part of what we were trying to do is develop um, and validate a dossier evaluation tool for CARMS dossier reviewers to use during each dossier review. And the idea was following the creation of the tool, we would assess for inter-rater reliability because that was one of the key things to help with the standardization piece. Um, the goal, again, the creation of the tool and improved file review process would ideally allow a program to efficiently select the most appropriate candidates um, for interviews but also in the long run, improve our match rate and selection process and possibly even reduce the, the need for resident remediation. And these are all kind of longer term goals that we'll be looking at. So every kind of study starts somewhere, right? So where do we start? We started with the literature. So we, there were over uh, 90 articles that were selected with some excellent help from uh, the librarian um, at the university. And we did a literature review to kind of look at what are the important elements um, that should be found in a dossier when evaluating a dossier, dossier being a CARMS, a CARMS file. Um, we use this data to create what we're gonna call now survey number one. And really what that survey focused on was what are these perceived elements? And some of the categories that kind of came out were demographic information, reference letters, personal characteristics and experiences, um, are there red flags in the dossier or are there specific statements in the dossier, especially in reference letters, about whether we should rank or not rank someone? And it was actually good uh, literature to kind of suggest that would be an important thing to actually look at when reviewing the file. So that led us to developing some questions. And some of these questions in the survey, as you can see here, um, you know, for instance, would be what elements of a dossier do, do you believe to be most relevant uh, to determine suitability for family medicine specialty? Or, list three to five qualities that you feel are relevant when selecting an applicant uh, or what would be considered some red flags. And we kind of decided to leave these somewhat open-ended to kind of allow the people answering our survey to, um, to really kind of tell us what they think so we could distill that down further moving on. So that was our initial survey that we sent off. Uh, this was in January of 2021 and it was sent locally and as well as to the, the group of national program directors as well. Um, and to residents as well. And we received 13, 13 answers. Um, and what we did is we looked at um, the results and assessed for kind of common unifying themes that we could potentially use um, to create our next survey. So what we did basically, we looked for themes um, and we found that there were essentially um, 56 elements that we thought that we could ask um, the, the people we send our next survey to to see what they felt would be important or, or not important when reviewing uh, a file review. So this was kind of our step two that we did in late January. And basically this was an example of what the survey itself was. So 
what we said is you will be asked to rank various dosi elements and whether they are important or not important on a scale of one to nine. And these are some of the examples. So for instance, um, you know, when reviewing a dossier as a whole, what is the strength of the candidate's connection to the city of the program? Or when reviewing the dossier of a, as a whole, was there comments on remediation or extension of training? Um, when looking at the reference letter, was there talk about candidate resiliency? Um, when looking at the personal letter, did the, does the candidate know their career goal? So there were actually 56 questions like that that were actually developed. And once again, sent out to a group to, again, locally and nationally, to which we received um, 15, 15 respondents. And at that point, um, we used um, a modified Delphi approach to kind of look for where was their consensus? Where were there actually elements that this group of people who answered our survey felt where there was consistency? So uh, by doing this, there were actually almost 50%. So 25 of the 56 um, elements actually reached reach a certain amount of consensus. So we felt like, okay, now we have some good information. Now we need to kind of go on to our next step and actually create a tool with this information. So um, our team sat down um, over a couple of meetings, uh, extracted some of the data and created a, a tool that was 51 questions. So it wasn't, it wasn't short, um, but again, we were trying to really uh, get a good sense of uh, how people felt about it, right? So um, the questions were a yes and no scale and, um, and a rating scale for some of them. And they were divided into sections. Um, dossier, Dean's letter, reference letter, personal letter, and an overall assessment as well. Um, there were some examples here of the questions that we actually used um, as part of the, the tool. So for example, does the Dean's letter contain professionals and concerns? And the idea really here was we wanted people to really hone in on what we felt were uh, important parts of the tool based on kind of the literature, uh, or sorry, important parts of a dossier based on the literature and on based on um, the feedback we received in the surveys we um, we created. So we created this tool um, and immediate goals were really to look for integrator reliability and see how we could actually um, receive some feedback um, on the tool itself. So we decided to pilot the tool in March of 2021. And we were very fortunate to have a group of uh, 15 volunteer DOSA reviewers to pilot our new tool. Uh, we held standardization sessions with this group. Um, and basically we asked them to review a total of 165 files, um, not, each per, not each person as a total amongst 15 people. Each person, um, each file that was reviewed three times by three independent people, so we could assen essentially assess for integrator reliability. Um, these were candidates who applied in this round of terms, but it was a separate process um, to ensure the scores did not impact the candidates' ranking at all. So the tool was piloted, and really what we were looking for as a first step was, you know, was there integrator inter reliability in some of the elements? And, in almost a third of the elements that we looked at, we actually found that there was integrator reliability, which we were actually you know, quite happy about. We th there was a certain level of consistency um, in 17 elements. And really we kind of grouped those into to themes and some of the elements that achieved good integrator reliability, um, for example, were you know, family medicine affirming factors. So what we mean by that is, you know, the people who reviewed the file, they could all reliably identify, you know, uh, does the candidate note why um, they want family medicine in their personal life? Um, or does the candidate kind of understand what encompasses a career in family medicine? Um, there was also reliability when we're looking at the file in terms of professionalism um, or, you know, should an interview be offered or was there missing elements? Those were the questions where uh, inter-rater reliability was found. So we felt like this was something we could actually use to kind of build on. But the other piece that we wanted to look at was, you know, was the tool actually easy to use or not? That was like the feedback we sent to the 15 people who actually did the file review for us. And, you know, the vast majority did feel like the tool was actually easy to use. So this was positive. Uh, but we also wanted to know is, did, did people feel like it met the goal of standardizing the dosage review process? And this was mixed, right? This was 50-50 or more on the side of, no, they didn't feel that it met that goal. And this is actually, really important feedback for us as we move forward to see, you know, what are the things we can do to ensure that it is more standardized. Um, you know, some people felt that the, the tool was easy to use. It ensures that a, a, a total review um, of the file is complete, not faster, but more complete. 
some people felt it was onerous. And again, this is important. This is the kind of stuff we're actually looking for as we build it, uh, build it further, essentially. Um, so really, that's where we're at right now in terms of, you know, we're in year one of a, of a two year study. Um, our goal is now to kind of use those questions with higher integrated reliability to be used as a defined, refined dosi evaluation tool that we can use as part of our next round of terms. Um, obviously with our bigger long-term um, goals of, of the of best selection, essentially. So that's kind of where we're at right now. And really this we feel impacts all members of our department, right? As we want everyone to be involved in current review, uh, reviews. And we're really looking to the team here, um, either now or after, if there are suggestions in terms of what we can do to kind of keep improving things. Great. Well, thank you, So Hill and Ed, uh, for that presentation. We do have some time for questions. So um, either put a question in the chat or um, ask your question. Or, or, or volunteer for next year's file review process. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I ask a quick question? Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, yep. the, um, I, I put sort of a comment, I guess, in the chat, just in that study looking at um, you know the amount of agreement about who should get an interview uh, could you comment on on that particular um, item there as far as the six percent only agreement so that's actually not that six percent agreed and I know it's a bit it took me a while to grasp it as well it's more that that was within the elements where there was good interrater reliability so we had a different cutoff for that, but then we split up the different elements that had integrated reliability. And that was one of the lower elements in terms of the majority of integrated reliability was based on family medicine affirming factors, like us identifying why does someone actually want to have a career in family medicine? Uh, but 6% of that overall 33% was part of making a decision of why someone or whether we should offer an interview or not. So it met the first criteria of meeting inter-rater reliability, uh, which was good. But then we just wanted to show within that, that how do we, what are the various categories of inter reliability, basically. That's the way we kind of looked at it. I don't know if Eddie wanted to add anything to that or. But, but that is a, I mean, that's a very important question you bring up, Doug. And I think that's why we wanted to, this is why this was the, you know, the spaghetti on the wall type stuff to sort of see what we would come out of there. And that's what we'd like to, in, the, in part two of this next year, when we do this again, and we glean some of the questions and try and figure out with some of the feedback, we want that number to go up, essentially. Because the ultimate idea is that what, who you feel should come for an interview should be who I feel should come for an interview. And that's going to be the process like this is hopefully what will come out of next year it may not be 50 percent, but we're hoping it'll we'll move it from six percent let's say of that that group to a, a higher number because <laughs> i don't think even with this like and soil and i said even if we didn't get this grant um this is part of the thing we're interested in anyway so we would want to keep moving this thing forward regardless of what happens in the next couple of years and finding those elements and sweet spots is just just to give you some context this is something that is looked at in the entire country over. And as you guys might have been paying attention over the last year, there was the um, controversy over the um, standardized letter of reference or the standardized reference form that came out this past year that got a lot of bad press. The, um, it was something that was um, developed and to help improve this process, but because there was a lot of kind of in the Twitterverse, let's say there was a lot of information that came out that said it was unfair to applicants, which wasn't necessarily the case, but I think it was it came very quick. It, it sort of came down the pipe a little bit too quickly for people. It got shot out and said, well, we'll put this aside for next year, but next year that's coming out. So this will be another element, the standardized reference form that might actually help bring, <clears throat> you know, people's concepts of who would be interviewed a little bit closer together. So I think we're all kind of trying to find different ways of getting there, but we're definitely far from there yet. Because if we were, every school would be ranking everybody the same way. And that's definitely not the case. Uh, thank you. I can see that we're just about out of time. Um, we're just at about nine o'clock. There still are a few questions. I can see priest has got her hand up. There's a couple of questions in the chat. If you can stay on after nine o'clock, um, 
please do. Um, uh, and I also just want to say that um, next month, um, our presentations will be coming from uh, Winchester. Um, and uh, there's also evaluations. And Maddie's just going to put the um, uh, put the link uh, to the evaluations uh, uh, online here. So um, thank you very much, Alan, uh, Ed, and Sohil. Uh, fabulous discussion and um, presentation. Much appreciated. So again, if you can stay online, a uh, few more questions, that would be terrific. Thank you all. Prisa. I'm, I'm staying online because this is fabulous. Thank you, um, Ed uh, and Sohil and the team. This is uh, a lot of work from the person who's been doing that, of course, it was a huge lift of responsibility when you guys started that process. But from the perspective of EDI, I was wondering if you could track, first of all, your raiders in terms of their gender, their, you know, their uh, background, etc. Because that would be important because along the way, how it correlates with the selection of people and the inclusion and diversity of people that then we bring to the interview and therefore to our department would be extremely important. So I didn't see that table. I trust you. I know that like I totally trust Sohil and Ed in terms of paying attention to that. But selection of your raiders need to be transparent. How you selected them? How were you conscious of the diversity of that group? And how did that impact your uh, your recruitment and uh, successful candidate? Just just for the transparency of it, but most importantly for the impact that it will have on us and how we're going to include and be very conscious of not excluding some tremendous uh, candidates because of the, um, the way we included our raiders, if I'm making any sense. Oh, you want you want to take that, Sohil? And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think like so 100%. I think it's a, like it's a it's a fantastic point and it's something we, you know, obviously think about but can do better right I think absolutely and I think you know one of the pieces we still struggle with is even those 10 to 12 people doing the reviewers it's sometimes hard to get those people as well mm -hmm. um, they're still they're still like just everyone is so busy right so sometimes it's who's available right but I think there's definitely ways that we can kind of keep building on that so aspect. I would I would honestly say that the that part is so crucial that if it means that I get the two days to come and sit because I want to be the cause in the matter, right? Yeah. I don't want to blame the guys who were raiding, right? I actually want to contribute and make sure. So if this this is important enough that Ed has to say, no, I want these people released from whatever duty they have, because you have the the ability to do so. And then we are committed as a faculty to ensure that that happens. We're there, it's just that priorities uh, getting the way, unfortunately, and that's precisely why we keep on getting excluded because the per personal and professional um, prioritization prevents us from being in there. So whatever happens to include us in the process, uh, should happen because it's so important. And we have been criticized on that in the past on the Twitter and on social media. So we want to make sure that we are responding to what's out there about us. No, that's definitely true. And Parisa, I'll just uh, say you're, you're absolutely right. We did look though, in our very, it was, it was hard enough to, to recruit for the tool part of things, but you're absolutely right. We did look, to, uh, that was a conscious decision to try and look to see you know from different people anglophone francophone all different walks of life and things so that was a conscious decision but just so that you know june 29th i think there is a faculty development session on um uh edi in selection or something eh? so i can't remember who's putting it on. i think it's the university of manitoba is putting that on but it's virtual 
and it's uh, I think I believe it's June 29th. So that's something that both Sohil and I are interested in, and we're we're looking at that. Uh, we're going to try and attend. So, as your representatives, Paul Excellent. was going to say. Excellent. Yeah, hi. Sorry, Thanks for I, I didn't. I'm, I'm taking your job, Doug. I didn't mean to do that. No, Sorry. no, it's fine. Paul, go <laughs> ahead, and then I can see Alan. You've got a question in the chat, and Mariam as well. Thanks. That was excellent. Um, I just wonder uh, if if anybody has uh, addressed the root cause of our problem, which is the uh, the flow of water out of the stream from the undergraduate uh, programs, uh, which you know seems to have increased dramatically, and we're all sort of reacting to this, and it stems from a fear that. You know, people aren't going to get matched, uh, and they back up their specialty choice with 20 applications to family medicine, and uh, we end up reacting to this. And has there been any progress uh, in that regard? It's a tough question. <laughs> and you know, like, I don't know if you remember seeing Diane Delvis' article in the. Uh, this year about how that's you know people ridiculously doing this and pat, pat, patting their applications and doing that i mean it's a tough thing right i i don't know what the answer to that is because if you think about it it is possible that the top 100 or 200 applications are all the top 100 of internal medicine and neurosurgery and everything else right and we're sifting through all those as well because they've got all those awards and they've got all those this and that and the other thing right and they're actually diluting those people who might be just slightly below that are actually the hardcore family medicine people but because we're you know we're being so tough on on like trying to you know score everybody and do such a great job of seeing you know maybe we're scoring the wrong stuff because we're scoring internal medicine who are backing up like we don't know that you know that's not information we know just yet so maybe that would be something it's definitely a so and i have had this conversation over and over again and i don't think we know yet that differentiating feature like we don't know how to filter those people out yet that's like basically it i think i don't know what you think so hell but i know that that's one of the issues that we've that's, been struggling that's exactly with. it yeah yeah that's what you said alan Uh, my, my question was more, I was just interested in what you saw, because obviously when this project started, we didn't know everything was going to go virtual. Um, I think there was, I think there was still an assumption that uh, things were, were going to be normal. Um, and then this year, obviously it wasn't. Um, I was just interested to, to know whether you, you, you found that experience um, has changed or altered maybe the way that you, you looked at uh, the situation we're in now. Uh, interesting, eh? So, Hill, that's a. Are you talking about the way we did the file review process, that getting together thing that you're talking about, or are you talking about the entirety of the well, situation? I, I, well, I guess now that you, you did the file review process, and I, I suppose. I'm going to presume that when you were doing that, it was based on the assumption we were doing in-person interviews. Is that, is that, or maybe I've got that wrong. Um, no, no, we knew uh, we were going to have uh, virtual interviews this oh, year, okay, way so, long time ago. Like before we even did the file review process, we knew that this year. Okay, so then my question is, is not really, <laughs> that doesn't really matter then. Um, uh, one thing I will just say, just to, in, uh, to Paul's question um, thing uh, is, I think really it's, it's up to the undergrad curriculum to, to make family medicine more um, desirable. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to, to um, when you're trying to sift out whether we've got all these candidates who are backing up, I, I, I don't think there is a solution to that, but I think the undergrads, what we need to do maybe as a department is work on making family medicine just more of a first choice for, for the undergrads. I think that's where, the, that's where we have to really and, and actually selecting those people into family medicine who will eventually choose a primary care, whether like, like even primary care OB or whatever, but you're, you're totally right. I think that process, like, honestly, does everybody who gets into family medicine, does every, not to say that our, does everybody need a 4.9 GPA and has done tons and tons and tons of bench research and they're the ones who get into 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 medical school like 
it's clear that they're not necessarily going to choose family medicine. So there is, there's an, you know, this, this, what do you call it with this flow thing that you were talking about, Paul? I don't know what it was called, but there is the, definitely that, you know, this background that's going to be really causing difficulties for us in primary care and family medicine. So I agree with you, Alan. There's that thinking process that has to be upstream. Well, as I mentioned in my talk, it's we're, we're in a postmodern, well, family medicine is postmodern, but unfortunately, most candidates are probably still more modern than postmodern. Mm -hmm. um, so just a very scientific rationalism and that, uh, you know, maybe we need to figure out who we get as med students. Thank you all very much. And we'll see you next month. Thanks everyone.